have two of my awesome teammates here today. This is Matt and Greg, Matt and Lo, Greg Mefford. They're both senior staff engineers, senior staff engineers at Adobe. And we are announcing our very first open source project today. From Frame. So, from Frame, an Adobe, Adobe company. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna pass it over to them and they can tell you all about it. So please, welcome Matt and Greg. All right. Well, Matt and I are very excited to be here for various reasons, but uh, the reason we're up here instead of out there with you is that we're talking about, it'll start. Oh, okay. no, I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, <laughs> we want to show you this cool thing that we built. Uh, so yeah, Catherine already gave the intro, so I'll just kind of skip through what we were going to say there. Um, but the, the problem, wait, am I pa I'm passing this off this to you, right? Oh, okay. This is me. We didn't, we didn't rehearse this. Um, so the problem statement that we, uh, that we set out to solve here is that credo failures just take up so much of our time uh, because they happen at the wrong time in the workflow process, right? Like during CI, um, usually. And so we came up with the solution criteria here that we needed to be correct, fast, and invisible so that people will use it and they'll get value out of it. And then uh, the solution we came up with is something we call Styler. And we're gonna tell you a little bit about how we built it. And then also we're gonna tell you a little bit about the results, both expected and unexpected. Cool. Uh, I kind of started this project off, and so that's why I'm jumping in to talk about it first here. Uh, so like Greg was saying, there's this problem that happens, and I think it happens to everybody here, that is like slowing us down, but we accept it as kind of just a cost of doing business. Um, and what, what happens is we're just doing our normal workflow. You're wrapping up a PR, mixed test passed, you've run mixed format, you commit it, you push it, you're done, you take your next ticket off of the queue or start something else right. And then 10 minutes later, you get a notification that's like, hey, CI failed. What's gone wrong there? Now you have to do this context switch to go back over there. I know that my test passed, I know my code is formatted. What else could CI be mad at me about? Oh yeah. So this is actually from our uh, Git repo and we're supposed to like squash our commits down and get rid of kind of fix up messages. But often the thing that's going wrong is Credo. And now I just want to be really clear. We'll talk about Credo a lot here. Credo is an invaluable tool. We're really big fans. We put a lot of work into making sure that it runs and runs well at our company. Um, it, the only issue here is just that when we have these failures coming in and biting people afterwards, it's just losing time. And you just kind of go like, eh, that's the cost we have of having a consistent code base. But it's still real engineering time that we're losing, right? Especially when you're doing those context churns after you thought you were wrapped up with things. And so what are the ways that you can get those credo failures that you're just kind of like, oh, really? And the big one for me is always sorting aliases. Um, it's just such a, like, I'm bad at the alphabet, frankly. I don't know where those letters go. I try my best, I throw it in there. I get it wrong all the time. Too many pipes, too few pipes. It's this nuanced thing. How many pipes should be in my thing? Well, just one is wrong. You need more, right? Or like that thing isn't the good start of a pipe. You need to add another pipe. So those sorts of stuff where you're just like, these aren't the ideas of how my software works. This is just style that keeps things consistent for my team, which does matter. And then things like I forgot a debug statement in there when I pushed it up. So I'm going to tell you that some of these things, a computer could do so much better than me. Like by the time a computer has said, hey, this isn't alphabetically sorted, it could have done that work for me. And in fact, I have a plug in my editor that does that work for me. Because I'm like, I, don't, I still don't know. You can tell me it's wrong, but I don't know how to fix it. But a computer knows how to fix it. So why did the computer fail and then tell me to fix it? Like, it, it knows the solution already. By the time it's telling me, it could have done that work. And for those people who know me, if Jeffrey's in here somewhere, he can tell you. He's working on his slides. I won't interrupt you again. Sorry, dude. <laughs> but <laughs> Jeffrey will tell you, I hate doing work. I'm like, classic. I don't want to do any work ever. And so. Oh, there, there is one thing, right? That forgot a debug statement. The computer, I don't want to automatically fix for, that, for me. I put that in there because I wanted it. At the end, yeah, maybe I want it removed, but I don't want it removed right away. That was an intentional thing and I forgot it. I got to take care of that. So the computer can't fix all my problems. Maybe eventually when we release Styler GPT, but <laughs> right now there are some things the engineer still has to do. But we want to talk about the things that a computer could do better. Um, so imagine I had this code right here. You know, it's just kind of a jumbly mess. Given this, I really want a tool that will do the work for me. 
to, presume, to give us this. And like the spoiler alert, right, is I did not fix that code. And so uh, if I have this idea, I gotta convince my bosses to pay me to do it. That's, that's where I was at at the beginning of this year. Luckily, a year ago, I already worked with a terrific library sorcerer to give us the ability to enable some credo rules, specifically single pipe and pipe chain start on our super large legacy code base. Um, and I kind of just was thinking, what if we could just run that all the time as part of our normal workflow? So I pitched our managers and I said, hey, pay me to fix it for everyone forever. This is gonna save you money in the long run because if that little context churn that people are doing just takes 30 minutes out of their week and we have 30 engineers like Catherine was saying and there's something like 50 weeks in a year, close enough. I think the other numbers are right, 60 minutes an hour, eight hours in a work day to be clear. Then we're talking about like 100 days of engineering work. If any of you are like responsible for writing the checks to your engineers, that number would probably make you really sad. So my proposal is hey, pay me to do two weeks of work and I will save you this much work of lost time a year. And so that's, that's kind of what I threw at James and Catherine. Unfortunately for me, they said, yeah, that sounds great. Now the problem with them saying that sounds great is I have to do the work now. <laughs> I have to deliver, least favorite thing. And so while I'm kind of pondering how will I get the computer to do work for me, I took that a step further and I said, what if I could get a coworker to do the work for me? <laughs> And that's when I reached out to my friend Greg. <laughs> yeah, so those of you who know me will know that I'm kind of a tryhard. So, uh, we, so we set out and we came up with these, uh, actually these, I mean, let's be honest, these are, these are back calculated uh, engineering goals that we had. These are the engineering goals we're gonna pretend like we had up front. Uh, <laughs> We want to we want to make it correct, right? Because if it if it is broken and it messes up your code, that that's more harm than good, and people are not going to want to use it, and they'll just get rid of it. Um, we want to make it fast because if it's slow, then again, people will just try to avoid running it, or they'll complain about it, or whatever. It'll be a waste of our time to build it. And then finally, invisible is kind of similar, right? We want it to be part of their normal workflow, not another thing that they have to remember to run, because then they just won't run it, and then Credo will yell at them, and then it will it will have been a waste of time. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about first how we made it correct. Um, if you've ever set out to make a tool like this, I mean, if you don't know anything about the space, you might just reach for something like a regular expression, right, to manipulate the text. But uh, it turns out that Elixir syntax isn't too complicated, but if you look in our code base, there's some pretty wild things that are possible. Um, and so we didn't want to rely on just regular expressions to fix those things. So what we would need to do instead is use AST. And I'm not going to spell out that acronym because I don't think I can do it, but here it is for you, abstract syntax tree. So uh, this is some code. It's not very complicated. And Elixir has some tools that you can use to turn that into what's called the AST. Um, and this is what that looks like. You can kind of see that each of the little pieces of the code there is represented in this, this data structure. And as we manipulate that data structure, we can, we can manipulate the code, right, if we run some things in reverse. Uh, we can also visualize that as a tree, so that's why it has the word tree in it. Um, you can, again, you can see that there's like a def there, and then it tells you what the name of the def is and what its parameters are called. And then on the right side, you can see that there's the body of the def that has a function call that takes parameters. Um, we can also uh, kind of look at how the AST works by pattern matching, and this is actually how we end up using the AST in order to do the manipulations. Because if we can pattern match it out, and then we can mutate it a little bit, and then you know send it back, then we have modified our AST. So here you can see that y the a def is really just a head and a body, uh, and some metadata that we're going to ignore for now. Uh, and then the head is where the function name is declared. Uh, you can also see that there's the parameters to the function there. And by the way, those atoms are the names of the thing, right? They're just atoms. Um, and then you can also see that the body here uh, is a keyword list, and that's how the do thing works. And it doesn't have anything else, like you could have a rescue in there, and that's where that would show up as like another keyword list entry. Uh, and then inside the body, we see the representation for the function call happening there with the arguments. Okay, so we have some opinions. Um, the formatter is a little bit loose in the, in the things that it allows you to do. 
And we figured when there's a lot of ways to do something, we should just choose one, and then it'll be more consistent, especially if we could have a tool that would just make it consistent for us. Uh, so we want to choose one consistently. Consistently. So we built Styler to have opinions, of course. Uh, we encoded our opinions in there. We tried to keep it three laws safe, um, but I don't know if we've succeeded. We'll see. So we have this acronym for you. We have opinions, so Styler has opinions. Whose show? Our show. <laughs> you got it. Here, I'll go back. <laughs> you see it now? Okay, good. That'll come back later. Um, so I just wanted to show you a couple examples here. You know, we've been teasing you a little bit about this thing we might have built. Uh, so our opinion is that you just shouldn't have a case with true and false because that's basically the same thing as an if. Um, so this is, you know, we like this bottom one better. Um, this example has a couple things going on. So one is that if you do enum into an empty map, it turns it into a map. But also map.new does that, and it's just a little bit simpler. But you can also see that this, this bare value is getting passed into a single pipe, and we don't really like that either because it's just the first argument. So that's much better. And then finally, um, for these defs where it's short enough that it could fit on one line, but the formatter doesn't make you put it on one line. So we're just like, but why, why would you do that, though? Uh, so we like the bottom one better. Uh, you might also recognize this from a previous talk that I gave at the Elixir Wiz Wizards conference in 2021. Um, the video from that is lost to the sands of time, so I would love if somebody could find it. But luckily, I still have the slides, so I can share that with you. But anyway, I presented that uh, this looks good to both me and the formatter uh, at the end of the day. So this is the story of a dev. <laughs> Had so many lines, it made me feel stressed. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you uh, how we did that, basically. Uh, so there's several kinds of defs. Uh, there's like a def and a def p and a def macro and such. Yeah, you guys like that, huh? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so uh, the AST, uh, it turns out, doesn't really care about line breaks, right? That's not really part of the code, uh, white space and line breaks and stuff. So we wanted to figure out how can I change the AST so that it collapses that line for us in the way that we want to. This is a little bit more scary AST, but I just want to kind of show you what the real thing looks like. So that's the whole def module, and then it has all the stuff in it. Uh, and if we zoom in to that, just the def part a little bit, um, you can see that there's some metadata in there that we ignored before, and you can see that it has uh, the def on line two, it has the do on line five. You can kind of get a feel for like, okay, the stuff's in there, good. We, we might be able to do this. Uh, the end is on line eight, and then there's this param one that's on line three, et cetera. So basically, what we were thinking is we can just remove some of that, n some of the metadata there, remove the new lines or adjust the line numbers or whatever, and then well, bam, we'll be done. Uh, so and actually, it worked out pretty well, uh, except that it turns out that comments aren't in the AST, so they just stayed wherever the heck they were uh, in the file. <laughs> and uh, so let's talk about why that happened a little bit. Um, it turns out Elixir also has this other function, string to quoted with comments, so then you get your AST and the comment metadata. And you might be not surprised to find that the comment metadata similarly has the line numbers, uh, it has the the whether or not it has a new line before or after it, and how many, like if you had a bunch of new lines after it. Um, so this is kind of what the code looks like to Elixir when you, when you do that string to quoted with comments. You get kind of the AST, which it knows which lines it's on, right? So it leaves the blank lines in there, but then the comments are a separate data structure. Uh, so we wanted to have Styler do this, uh, but that's where you can see how the comments got all messed up, right? If you merged those back together, they wouldn't be where you wanted them anymore. Um, so we figured out a pretty simple algorithm uh, to deal with this problem where if we're collapsing lines, we can displace any comments that are in there to the, basically the line before it uh, because that's, that's what we decided we wanted to do, right? If you, if you had comments next to these parameters, it makes the most sense to just put them before and then a developer has to fix it. Um, and then I'm, I'm just noting here that both of those are on line two, even though that doesn't really make sense in the graphic here, but like we just set both of them to line two. And then the other thing we might need to do is shift by a delta, because if you collapse some lines above something, you might have to shift everything up to fill that space. Um, so then that's what we're doing here, is, is we're just taking anything that was in the former body and just moving it up to where the new body is going to be. And then we also shift the code. I didn't put a red arrow in there for that. So this is kind of what we end up with at the end, is there's some stuff sort of like waiting to shove itself into line two, and then there's something on line 10 and line three. 
Uh, and then you can kind of visually see that those will merge back together and you'll get exactly what we wanted. So yes, we've made it correct. And now I'm tired, so I'm gonna pass it back to Matt. Thanks. Uh, I actually have three things I wanna throw out that aren't even on this slide. The first was, thank you, Greg, for saying we through that. That was, this is how I get by in my career. <laughs> Uh, the second is before this talk started, Sigu came up and ribbed on me, thanks buddy, and I asked him, hey, you don't mind if we just go straight through your talk time, do you? And he said, please do. Sigu, good news, this 25 minute timer is actually 25 hours. We're gonna be here for a while, folks. Timer's not quite right. Okay, uh, so now that Greg kind of walked us through how we're using that AST to make Styler correct, I'm gonna talk about how we're gonna make it fast and how it's not, necessarily the case that it'll be fast really easily right up front. And so we need to talk about how trees work in Elixir. Um, Styler's gonna be going through these trees and just grabbing some arbitrary node deep in there and being like, mm, this is wrong, I'm changing it, I'm putting something new in here. Now with like, probably a lot of us did not start in functional programming, in non-immutable languages, which I think there's just a word for, but I can't, I, I'm like it's non-immutable, there's immutable in the other one. Uh, in those languages, it's really simple to do because you just find that place in memory and you overwrite it. You can just destroy what was there and put something new in there. It's quick, it just happens, right? But that's not how things work in Elixir in the beam. We're working in an immutable place. When you update a large data structure, it doesn't do it in a destructive way. What actually happens is everything that needs changing as a repercussion of that change gets copied over. And so there are expenses to coming into this tree and being like, I wanna change this plus sign to a minus sign. This is what happens when you do that uh, with the beam. I've got my plus, I kick it over to a minus, life is good, but behind the scenes, you didn't do this. The beam is just doing this because that's how it works. All these nodes above that minus sign just got copied as well. And so what that means is however deep you are in the tree, you do an edit, everything up above it gets copied as well. And so not a huge cost. That's gonna be, if you're a nerd out there, that's like log in. It's not the worst thing. A lot of people are super excited about that. But we could be doing that in times. We could do it at every node. And so it's just something that we're gonna pay a cost for over and over. Now that was, that's a problem when I'm down at the bottom, but if I edited that top node, right, there's nothing above it, so that would just happen immediately. Like if I change that def to a def p in the AST, that just goes boom. What if we could have that happen everywhere in the tree? Like treat every node like it's the top node. Well, once again, I'm gonna steal someone else's work and pretend I did it. Um, in 97, Gerard Hewitt wrote a paper about the zipper. This is a common data structure in a bunch of other functional programming languages. I think he was talking about it in like a Perl magazine perhaps. Um, he cutely called it a nifty name for a nifty data structure. I personally stole this from Sorcerer. We forked uh, their implementation. Sorcerer is awesome. Huge shout out to Dorgan. Um, so great working with them. But we grabbed the zipper for our implementation as well. So I'm going to talk about what this thing is kind of briefly and how it really helped us out. So a zipper changes the way that we're representing how we're going through the tree. Instead of just kind of naively doing it, it gives us this fancy little data structure that has the focus on one side, which is like the current subtree that we're looking at. And by doing that, we can pretend that every subtree is the top of the tree. So we're gonna get that like, hey, I don't, there's nothing above you, I can just change you, no problem, constant time. The trick that lets us do that is we're keeping an inverted path of how we got to that node, so that as we go back up in our traversal, we're kind of like rebuilding thin. And so that's when we're gonna occur co incur the costs. So because what we do is we're going down through the tree, we're going right through the tree, we're editing the tree a lot, all of those things become constant time in a zipper. Um, and so this is gonna let us do a lot of updates to a tree very quickly and efficiently. So like again, that focus says, hey, you're right here, you're looking at this node, as far as I know, this is the top of the tree. And if I edit that thing now, because I've done this inverted thing, and that's where the like zipping idea comes from, I'm like going down, I'm unzipping the tree, when I go back up, I'll zip it back up. The implementation of replace is really easy in this situation. And I wanted to show it to you, even though there's lots of words kind of up here right now, just to show you how like, hey, when I replace where I'm at with a new tree, I just take whatever I had and I throw it away, and I put the new tree in there. And what, what's really interesting here is the path stayed the same, right? I don't have to update how I got here. I don't need to update everyone that's above me. So that log of n thing is now 
just constant time. So now I do that edit here and I just do it. We're good because I'm relying on the path to rebuild things as I go up. And that, like, whereas before, every time I edit in a subtree, I recopy everything. Now I just do those edits as I go, and I'll do that work when I'm coming back up the tree after my traversal. Um, here's just a quick nerd slide. I already kind of said this, but again, all the things that we're doing a lot of are now constant time when we're using the zipper. Uh, another neat thing that the zipper gets us is kind of like, a nice DSL, it's ergonomic like that last slide said, where now we can like take advantage of our knowledge of the AST to kind of go through it intelligently instead of visiting every node. And there's about to be a lot more code. I'm sorry, I'll bring in a buffer and we'll look at less of it at once. But this is the actual code, uh, at the top of the code that sorted that module directives thing for us before. So it's important that it's like, we're still just using AST. The zipper is a very light data structure. Like that left-hand side is always just a tree. So I'm using the same thing that Greg already had, where I'm like, hey, look for this node of AST, and when I see it, I can immediately know what's gonna be inside of it. The def module has this complicated structure. And when I'm looking at a def module, I can ignore almost everything, and I just wanna move directly to its body. That focus here next variable right there is the module's body, where all the statements actually are. And it's like, I can just bust out the Konami code. I'm like, oh, you're at the, do you're at the def module? Oh, you want the body? Oh, just go down right, down, down right. You're there. So now I've got the zipper's body. It's that easy. <laughs> Definitely want to leave a comment there, but uh, it's that easy, right? So these are the kind of like neat optimizations. Does this make it that much faster? Probably not, but it's cute. And uh, it is important when we're trying to use our knowledge of the AST to do stuff. So as far as fast stuff goes, obviously I just ran these things until I got numbers that make me look good, don't trust me, but um, this is, you can see like mixed format on our code base takes 3.3-ish seconds, like it's a pretty gosh darn big code base, so it does take a minute. Mixed style doesn't take that much longer, and something we haven't said is mixed style relies on mixed format. We use all these stuff that Greg already showed you. You notice how there's like six empty lines at the end of his defs thing there? Well, we just hand that off to the formatter and we're like, hey, we made some junk, would you clean this up for us now? And it just, boop, does all the real lifting. So honestly, all, most of the time in that 3.4 seconds is just format. Our stuff is running in that like extra 10% of the time. And it, I've played around a little, it looks like in general, Styler will slow you down about 10%. So I think that's pretty acceptable. But the problem here is we have a new command that's not part of the workflow. So maybe it's fast enough that people will run it, whereas Credo takes too long, but we have to teach people about a new tool. We need to not do that. We're fast, but we're not yet invisible. How do we make it invisible? Oh, oh, the formatter just has plugins. I already told you everything we did was just the formatter with a little sauce on top. Turns out Jose foresaw this world with his infinite wisdom uh, and saved us a lot of work duplicating what formatter does. And we definitely knew that right from the start, for sure. Um, <laughs> But honestly, James knew that from the start, and we didn't listen to him, and then we did it at the end. My managers will tell me that I just never listen, or tell you that I never listen. That's how it works. Um, but yeah, so the one misunderstanding we had was like, well, formatter's already doing your .ex, .exs files. You can't have a plugin that like hijacks that, can you? But no, you absolutely can. Formatter doesn't care. If you say, formatter, cut it out, I'll handle those files, it's happy to do that. And so now, we, by making it a formatter plugin, this is all we have to do to get Styler into your developer's workflow. Add the dependency, put the plug in there, and now whenever they run mixed format, which we do, right? Mix test, mix format, commit and push. Shut up, Chris. Well, you could now, though. I made it, it's good. <laughs> uh, so, so now it like works, right? Um, and it's simple, it's invisible, it's part of people's workflow. And there's no configuration, because who show? Our show. We already know what the right answers are. We decided for you, you're welcome. Got it. So that's kind of the best part. There's no configuration. And that's, uh, that's it. We did all three of our things. Greg, what's the next slide again? Uh, this looks like work. Uh, yep. I'm out. Yep, I'll take over from here. Okay. Yep, give you some results. Need, the managers need results, Matt. All right, KPIs and stuff. So as we said at the beginning, uh, we have some expected results. Uh, just to, you know, get, we need that green check that we actually do have fewer CI context switches. Turns out, yes, we do. Um, there's also less uh, Credo rules running because Styler takes care of those, so we just took them out. Now Credo also runs faster. We didn't even, I mean, I don't remember that we thought that, but that is also a thing. 
Uh, now things fail during format uh, instead of in CI. So that gives you a lot, you know, just quicker, quicker loop. Um, and yeah, it's, yeah, I'll skip some of that other stuff. Cool. So uh, one of the things that we went out to solve is like, don't tell me what the problem is, just do it. Like the stuff that the computer can just do quickly. Uh, even if the fix is obvious, it's this huge distraction to go back and fix it. So we just don't have that anymore for this list of rules uh, that we don't do in Credo anymore. And then also Matt has a trolling one down there at the bottom to represent the other things that Credo doesn't do for you or check for you uh, that we just think are a good idea. Um, and then this was an example of one of, the, one of the things that we wanted to eliminate is these conversations about, hey, uh, coworker, could you please do it this other way that we really like? Uh, but I know that you've copy and pasted it from all over the place and uh, it's not your fault, but like, can you please fix this one? Uh, so we don't have those as much anymore. Uh, and then speaking of uh, those kinds of results, we also had some unexpected results that we weren't out to solve, but uh, we were able to solve anyway. So there's always this backlog of just like code that makes people sad when they look at it, but it's like, oh, there's just so much of it. There's, you're never gonna be able to go solve it all. It's like such a waste of time. Um, and we want to like put more credo rules in, but we can't because they, there's so many violations. Like nobody wants to spend time on 7,000 violations. Uh, and then so if you start to piecemeal roll it out, like nobody's ever gonna finish that project. This is a big company. Um, so yeah, mechanizing those corrections made it all a lot more possible. Um, so this is a, a, a review that we got from an internal uh, coworker, and they were asking, what's this mixed style thing that you guys uh, put in here? Like, how does that work? Can I, you know, was that like built in house or where do I learn more about that? And Matt's like, oh no, what have we done? Uh, this, this is in our code base now and people are having a bad time. And they're like, no, no, uh, it wasn't a problem. I just was wondering if I could use this for my own stuff. So that's, that's the kind of rave reviews you like to see. Uh, Matt already touched on some of this stuff, but we kind of didn't really expect this side benefit of having this refactoring sidekick for us. Uh, for all the tedious nonsense like sorting things and you know piping and unpiping, can't tell you how much time I've spent unpiping and piping when I'm like realizing, oh, I just want to make one function call. No, I kind of want another one. Oh, actually, I just want one again. And it's just like back and forth all day. So, uh, yeah, yep. Uh, sorry, I was supposed to say that there. Okay, cool. Yeah, collapsing defs. Yep, all that kind of stuff. All right, so uh, yeah, I've, I've told you what we were gonna tell oh, you and then, I got, yeah. yeah. So now that Greg's done the work, <laughs> uh, I'll just come in and review things to make it look like I also participated today. So here's what Greg, here's what we told you today. Um, so again, like I wanna emphasize we're not bashing on Credo. This is a very necessary tool, but it just, there are some like downsides to it that at a smaller team, not as much of a problem, but when you have a big enough team, it's real costs and so, those credo issues were kind of like biting us more than we like. So we came up with Styler, which is an AST rewriter that uses the zipper, Dorgan, you're a hero, to do things so quickly and invisibly for you that you just like have it and your life is better. Uh, thanks, Jose, for figuring out what we needed before we realized it. Um, and we, we knew we would get faster kind of like CI loops and we don't mean just like our CI completed faster, we mean our CI didn't interrupt us needlessly as much anymore, and that's really important. Um, but that it was so cool to see a teammate, or I was like, oh, what did I break, and have him just be like, no, this is, could, could I use this like on my stuff? And uh, we're kind of like, we'll see what we can do about that. Uh, and the less toil, like I'm refactoring and consolidating code all the time, they might have the same alias in both modules, I can just paste that wherever the heck I want in my file, Styler will move it to the top, Styler will deduplicate it for me if it's there, so I can just focus on that function I'm updating and just like not have to scroll my editor ever to the top to put things where they belong. Styler handles that for me, it's beautiful, and I get to focus on the real problems that matter here, right? Syntax is not what I'm getting paid for, it's the value and meaning of the work that I produce, so we're about that semantics in the code. So yeah, that, that coworker absolutely can use it, in his projects now because it is open source. Adobe said, yeah, go for it. They were super cool about that. We were kind of blown away how easy it was to put out this open source project that like they paid us to make. So shout out to Adobe for just being like, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's definitely just a heads up. When you run this the first time, it's gonna be slow, not because it's thinking so hard, but because it is churning through disk IO. It's gonna touch all your files. I've been seeing people who try it out be like, oh, this just deleted a net 2,000 lines from my code base and my tests are still passing. So 
you know, less code is more code. It's great, is more gooder, rather. Um, it does so much that we didn't want to like throw it all on this presentation. We did like an alpha of this talk where we showed everything it does, and it turns out that was a 25 hour talk. So give it a try and just check out your diff, see what you like. Um, and it's gonna do things you don't like probably because we're just up here making decisions for you. Whose show, Ray? Uh, it's our show, Matt. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. So uh, like, like the formatter, it does things that you're not excited about maybe, but at least it keeps it consistent and that really matters more on a team. And you can now write things the way you like to write it and Styler will just put it the way your team likes to read it. Um, so that's, that's a really important thing. But yeah, so just give it a try. See if you can handle those things that you don't like. And if you don't, if you just like can't handle those things, it is open source, but Greg, I, I, don't, would, I don't, would you, this feels awkward. Would you say this for me? Yeah. Um, so we're a fork friendly project. Uh, this is our PR marketing spin. If you don't like how it works, it's open source. So, you know, you can just, you can just fork it, like make your own. That's, that's all I got. And that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Right before we wrap things up, though, this like all work is like built on so many other people's efforts. All of my work is actually someone else's work. So shout out to Adobe again for the open sourcing. Uh, Chris Keithley was the person who pointed out to me that like actually the only way to fix a code base like this would be to write code that rewrites the code. And you can do that now because have you seen the Sorcerer Library? Um, and shout out to Dorgan and their Sorcerer Library because Dorgan got those APIs that were private Elixir APIs to make it into the standard library now. And so that's why we actually ended up not even using Sorcerer, because it's just part of Elixir now, and that's thanks to Dorgan's work. So thanks a lot. And Dorgan also worked with me a ton when I did those initial Sorcerer rewrites, um, and I just really appreciate their time. Yeah, and then also just huge shout out to James and Catherine, our, our managers who are here today. You can talk to them, the legendary figures. Um, and then also the backend guild just being supportive of us as we figure all the stuff out in our alpha phase. And Credo, of course, for building a tool that like showed us all the warnings that we wanted to deal with and uh, doing a lot of that le legwork. Um, so I'll leave these links up on the screen until we do our, our presenter switch. But yeah, you can get it online and there it is. <laughs>